good evening to those following us on Facebook and good evening to those of us who are on the conference call. Hallelujah. I am just excited to be in the house of God this evening. We're going to start off with a word of prayer. God, we just thank you right now, Lord, just for the opportunity for us to just come into your house, God, even though all of us can't be here right now. God, I just thank you that you've developed the technology that we can still come together as a family just to worship your name and to hear your words today, God. And we just praise you for that. Lord, I just thank you. In Jesus we pray. Amen.
talks about often um, stewardship and how we are we are given things and God wants us to take care of them and I'm not saying anything that, that it wasn't stewarded before that's not what I'm saying but I'm saying that you know there were just some things that we saw that needed to be um, fixed needed to be repaired and unfortunately in the repairing process um, the crack was right down the middle of the mural that was on the stage and we unfortunately were unable to salvage that or save that 
So that's why we covered it, um, is because it needed to be fixed. But anyways, um, we're not done. We've still got a, we've still got a few other things to do. But you know what? Um, God is God is awesome. Amen. Anyways, so moving on here, Matthew the seventh chapter. And uh, if you guys have questions, if you guys have comments or anything, um, go ahead, put them right right in the comments. I, I'm right. I'm right here with you. Um, Matthew the seventh chapter. And uh, when it, it's it's hard for, it's hard for me to preach without somebody giving me an amen every now and then. So amen. if you feel like if you feel like chiming in there on the comments with an amen or two or an ouch or an oops or an oh, well just go ahead and do that. We love you. Anyway, so tonight we're going to read out of Matthew chapter seven. Starting in verse 1, and it says this, Do not judge, so that you won't be judged. For you will be judged by the same standard which you judge others, and you will be measured by the same measure you use. Why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye, but don't notice the beam of wood in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the splinter out of your eye, and look, there's a beam of wood in your own eye? Hypocrite. First take the beam of wood out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to take the splinter out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs, or toss your pearls before pigs, or they will trample them under their feet, and turn and tear you to pieces. Father, we thank you for your word, and God, I pray that you administer to your people tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I don't know about you, but I have heard often I have heard often that the term do not judge has it has anybody else ever been around somebody that said you can't judge me only God can judge me right and more often than not and, and I've heard this quoted by many people I've heard this uh, quoted often by even by people who are irreligious or don't go to church or don't claim to be Christian and they but but they know the phrase do not judge you can't judge me well I, I want to talk about that tonight and, and I want us to get a little bit I want us to bring a little bit of context into what we're talking about tonight amen so as most of you should know and if you are, are new Sitting under any kind of my teaching, you're going to know that you, you need to learn that context is everything. Anytime you study scripture, anytime you're reading the Bible, you would have to understand the context of what is going on so that people can see and understand what you are talking about. So the first thing we have to note is that Jesus is talking to a group of religious people. He is talking to a group of Pharisees and Sadducees. I'm sure there are other people in the mix, but primarily he's talking with them. And he says, now the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you see, see, I, I remember the Sadducees because they're always sad, you see. Um, anyways, better get some laughs on that. I know it's a bad joke. You see, but these people were the ruling religious elites of the day. They also made up the Sanhedrin, which was also the governing body of the day. Now, you might say, well, I thought they were under Roman rule. Well, they were. What they did, what the Romans did, is they said, what we're going to do is we're going to conquer you, and then we're going to leave the government in charge that was already in charge, but we're just going to tell them what to do. So they were, so they were able to follow their own rules. They were able to follow the, the, the Mosaic law and all of the traditions of the Pharisees and everything that went on there, but they were still ruled by the Romans. That's why you see that when they brought Jesus before the Sanhedrin and then they sent him before Pilate. Pilate was the Roman governor of the area and Pilate was the one who could give the death penalty. You see, the Jews couldn't give the death penalty. They could uphold their laws, their traditions, but they couldn't impose the death sentence. So that's why they had to send Jesus from the Sanhedrin to the uh, had to send them from the Sanhedrin to Pilate, the Roman governor, to be able to actually crucify him. You see, but this 
they were this body of people were they, they made rules and they traditions and they made traditions that they enforced on the people. Keeping in mind, though, we have to keep in mind that all of the rules, all of the, all of the traditions, everything that they made up was in addition to the law of Moses. And so Jesus is sitting there and he's talking to them and he says this phrase, do not judge. Okay. Well, first we've kind of got to go back and we've got to look and see what does this term judge mean? And the term judge could be translated out as condemn. Or there, there, there's a couple other words there, but primarily it could be used as do not judge, do not um, legislate against, do not condemn. So that you won't be condemned. And then in verse 2 he says this, for you will be judged by the same standard which you use to judge others and you will be measured by the same measure you use. So... What he's saying here is we have to be careful of what we do and what we say and the thoughts and actions that we're having. So the question I have, I get, the first question I have this evening is are you looking to justify your position with God? Okay, now you say that and you go, oh, okay, what are you talking about, Pastor? Am I looking to justify my position with God? That's a strange question to ask in light of this topic. Don't judge. But you see, this, that's exactly what the Pharisees were doing. They were trying to justify their position with God. And so it, it looks something like this. So my children love one another in their Greek because they never do anything wrong, right? No, I'm sorry. I, thou shalt not lie, Sean. My children do this stuff all the time, okay? One of them will come in and they will say, We've come, and Addison will come, and she'll say, Jackson won't let me play video games. And, and she'll say, he's making it too hard, or he's making it too difficult, or he's just being a jerk in general. And then from out of the other room, you will hear Jackson say, yeah, but she did the same thing to me yesterday. Yeah, but, and, the, and there's, there's, there's a rebuttal, right? And, and in, in our house... We call this throwing them under the bus. You know, it's kind of like being a, being a tattletale. But that's exactly what Jesus is talking to the Pharisees about right here. Because if we go on, he's saying, why do you look at the splinter in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the beam of wood in your own? What he's saying is, don't throw your brother under the bus. You see, the religious leaders were puffing themselves up and they were saying, look at me and look how good I look, look how good of, look how good I am, and look how much that person over there is a sinner. They were puffing themselves up. They were trying to make themselves feel better, I guess. Or they were trying to make themselves look better than they actually were. Now, how many of us do this in our own lives? We 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 say, you know, well, at least, you know, I, I'm not the most religious person in the world. But at least I'm not this person. Or at least my children don't do this. Right? How many of us have ever had those thoughts? How many of us have ever tried to justify sin in our own lives? Right? I, I remember growing up, you know, I used to say that, well, it's okay the preacher does it. Well, I saw the preacher's kids doing this, so it must be okay, right? But we look at other people sometimes, and we try to justify our sin. We try to justify that, what are we doing? Is it, is it okay to sleep around? Is it okay to live in a lifestyle that is anti-God? Is it okay to do things? No, it is not. There, there are standards, but there are standards that are laid out in Scripture, right? And the first thing that somebody will say to you is, don't, you can't judge me. It says, no. All judgment has to start in my house. I have to judge myself. 
All right, we're going to find out here in a couple weeks that there, there, are, there are times and there are places in the house of God, in the congregation of faith, where we do have to judge one another, where judgment is acceptable. But we have to reframe our thoughts of judgment. We have to reframe what we think about, and we have to get a biblical understanding of what God means when he says that he is the judge and when he is going to judge the world. We have to get a biblical idea of what he's talking about. But you see, we, we can even see multiple examples of the Pharisees trying to puff themselves up throughout Scripture, right? The first one is the woman who anointed Jesus' feet with her tears. Simon the Pharisee says, surely this man is not a prophet, for he would know that this woman is a sinner. <clears throat> you see, he, he had prejudged. He said, well, this I'm, I'm better because I don't do all of this stuff, and this woman is a sinner. And, and essentially, Jesus looks at him and says, listen, Simon, this, this woman's been set free. And because she understands who I am and you are not, you know, or, or what about the woman caught in adultery purely because they were trying to trap Jesus. They dragged this woman who is caught in adultery. And so apparently they must have known where she was. They must have known who she was. They must have had some idea and they elevated her sin and they said well she is an adulteress and our law says that she has to die so they brought her before Jesus to try to trap him in his words but he didn't say anything and we all know how that story ends you see Jesus was trying to address the problem in the religious community he was he see, see he's not talking to a bunch of Irreligious people here. He's not talking to the sinner. He's not talking to the woman at the well. He's not talking to the woman caught in adultery. He's not talking to anybody but the religious community. And he's saying, listen, you need to figure out your stuff first. You see, judgment must begin in the house of God. So we have to come to the place where we say we're not going to judge the world we're not going to judge those around us and we're not going to judge our brothers and sisters why because we understand that we all still have issues and we need to focus on ourselves you see jesus tells us in matthew 22 verse 37 and 38 it says this he says love the lord your god with all your heart with all your soul and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You see, he says that these are the two greatest commands in all of Scripture. He says the law and the prophets all boil down to this one thing, or these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. So we've got to remember when we're dealing with our brothers, we're dealing with our sisters, we're dealing with those that are inside the family of faith. Okay? We're not, we're not talking about dealing with the world. We're not talking about dealing with people who don't believe in Jesus. We're talking about dealing with people who are inside the community of faith. We're talking about people that are inside the church. And he says this. He says, do not judge them so that you won't be judged. But he says, love your neighbor as yourself in Matthew 22. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. So the second question I have tonight is, are we condemning those we are to lift up? Are we, are, are we condemning the world? Are we condemning those fellow believers in Christ because we're not supposed to. Are we loving them as we love ourselves? You see, the Greek word for judge in this verse, and do not judge, is this, is, is the word krino. K-R-I-N-O. And it means this, to decide 
to judge or condemn. And we got to remember not to condemn or to judge. And I've preached, I, 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 I jumped ahead in my notes apparently, and so I have preached all this, so give me just a second. But come on down here. When we judge one another, we are placing ourselves in the seat that God should occupy. Now, I want to say that again, and I, I want you to focus, I want you to listen to this real quick. Don't, don't, for all you note takers, stop taking notes for a second and listen. When we judge one another, okay, when we judge fellow Christians, we are placing ourselves in a seat that God should occupy. Okay? Judge not, because you are going to receive the same judgment that you give. You are going to receive. So if you are a harsh judge, you will receive a harsh judgment. Because Matthew 7, 2 says it this way, for you will be judged by the same standard which you judge others. You see, God is the one that is doing the judging in this verse. It's God is the one that sees the secret motives of the heart. God is the one who takes all of our ill intentions. He takes all of our everything and, and he weighs them at the end. He is the judge. But if we look historically... You see, we, we've got to understand what it means to be a judge in the Old Testament. We've got to understand what it means to be a judge in the New Testament. We've got to understand, because we have a Western mentality of what a judge is. And God is not a judge like the black gavel robe the black robed man or woman with the gavel waiting to cast sentence upon somebody that's not the kind of judge God is and I'm going to prove that to you tonight in scripture so God's historic role you see Yahweh made a covenant now what is a covenant you say a covenant is a contractual agreement. It is an agreement between two parties that says, if you do this, I will do this. It's agreed upon. It is a contract. It is sealed. You can see it all throughout the Old Testament that people would cut covenant together. They would come into agreement about one thing. They would cut covenant. And so Yahweh made a covenant with Abraham, and it was retroactive. You see that the covenant that God made with Abraham was not just with Abraham, but it was with Abraham and all of Abraham's descendants. He made a contractual agreement with Abraham, and that agreement came with legal rights to God. Legal rights were made because of that covenant. You see, God said this. He said, I am to be the ruler of this people when he cut covenant with Abraham. He says, I am the Lord your God. He says that in Exodus. I am the Lord your God who delivered you out of Egypt. I am the... He's saying this. He's not saying he's some weak need little nature God that he's talking about. He says, no, I am the Lord your God, and I am the one who is going to rule you. You see, it was God's intention to rule Israel forever. God never intended for there to be a king or a prime minister. God intended to rule Israel forever, and he still does. You see, Israel was meant to be ruled by God himself. That is why when they came out of Egypt, they were not led by a king. They were led by a prophet. They were not led by when, when, when they crossed into the promised land, Joshua didn't say, I am now your king. He said, no, I am the one who is going to seek God. I am going to hear his voice, and then I am going to do what that word has called me to do. You see, he was a, <coughs> excuse me, he was a, a prophet. He was somebody who knew how to hear the voice of the Lord 
and then do that. You see, God himself ruled Israel. You see, God himself was their king. He was their ruler. And that rulership came with legislative rights. Okay, now, what now? Okay, now you're, you're talking, using big words again now, Pastor. What are you talking about? So when God became the ruler of Israel, he then was able to legislate. He was able to bring government to these people. What do you mean by that? All of the Old Testament is legislative law. God said, if you do this, then this happens. Don't do this. And, and that's what all of the Old Testament law, all of the legislation, Jesus brought down to a boil. That's what they were talking about in Matthew 22 when he says, all of the law and the prophets, everything in the word of God, everything in the law hinges on two points. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hinge on those two things. Those two things are the legislative side of God. Okay? Following me? So that is rulership. That is kingship. Think of it this way. Our, a, a king has the ability to make and enact laws. Okay? The king of the times had the sole ability to enact and create and dictate laws. When the, what the king decreed, it became so. What God said became so. Okay? Follow me. But it wasn't until Israel was ruled by God until they decided that they wanted to be like everybody else and be ruled by man. You see, they didn't want to be ruled by God. They wanted to look like everybody else. Now, this could be a nice little side jog that I'm not going to take, but how often in our lives do we say, God, I don't want to be ruled by you. I want to look like everybody else. God, I don't want to do things your way. I, I want to look like everybody else looks. And so God allowed them, God gave them a king. But God did not just have legal authority, okay? He didn't just have that legislative side. As all kings, he had a judicial side, okay? Or a judge side. Because kings created laws, and then they had magistrates and people and themselves who upheld the law. They judged a matter to see if it was in line with the law. You see, God was the judge of Israel. I'm going to give you three scriptures, and I'm not going to give you the context for them. I want you to go look them up on your own. You can rewind this video when the live is over and you can get these three scriptures. You can write them down really quickly. But I want to give you three scriptures tonight that says God was the judge of Israel. The first scripture I'm going to give you tonight is Judges 11 and 27. Judges 11 and 27. And it says this, let the Lord... Who is judge. The Lord who is what? The Lord who is judge decide today. You see, Judges 11 and 27, it's in, the, it's in the B clause of Judges 11 and 27. That the Lord who is the judge decide between the Israelites and the Ammonites. Let God judge. Let God decide if our dispute is right or it is wrong. Let God decide what is going on, okay? The second scripture. 2 Samuel 18 and 31. It says this. It says, Then just as the Cushite came and said, May the Lord the king hear the good news. The Lord has vindicated you today 
by freeing those who rise against you. Now you say, well, Pastor, that didn't have the word judge in it. No, but it did have the word vindicate, which is another fancy way of saying judge. You see, God has ruled in your favor. God has vindicated you. You see, that's what, he, that's what the scripture is talking about. That God has come and God has said that I am going to fight for you. God has vindicated me. God has allowed me, with, without any effort on my side, God has vindicated me and he has created judgment for me. All right, the last one. Deuteronomy 33 and 21. Deuteronomy 33, verse 21. He provided, and we're going to talk about the, the very last statement in this. Okay? But I'm going to read the whole, I'm going to read the whole verse, but we're going to just talk about the last um, line here. It says, he provided the first part for himself because a lawgiver's portion was reserved there. He came with the heads of the people. Now, this is the part right here. He administered the justice of the Lord and his judgments with Israel. Now, this scripture is talking, this is the last prayer of Moses, and he is praying over the tribe of Gad. And this is the part of the prayer that he, he prays over Gad. And he says, but he administered the justice of the Lord and his judgments. Now, who, what are his judgments? Who's his? Who, who is the he that his is talking about? The his is God. You see, he's saying that this tribe, this leader of this tribe, he administered the justice of the Lord and God's judgments with Israel. You see, God's judgments in the Old Testament were not about you have failed. Okay? God's judgments were the victories of Israel. You see, God was their judge. Which in the Old Testament times, if you take the word, it's the word mispah, mispah. And it means that judge means protector. Judge means protector. So the judgments of God were all focused on the enemies of Israel. Okay? This is, this, this is important because we, 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 need, we need to shift our thinking here. Because we have a Western mentality that says that judge is coming to destroy me because I have failed. No, judge is coming to deal with the enemies of Israel. The judge, the judgment of God is designed to bring people back into right relationship. Okay? Because people are running around. And some of you might be getting mad at me right now, and that's okay. But we have got to shift this thinking in our mindset that says, God is out to get me. That God, God is fearful that, 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 yes, there is the fear of God. And yes, we should be fearful of God. We should be fearful because God is God. And any time that God shows up, there should be a holy hush and a holy awe. But I'm telling you, the judgments of God, when God comes to judge something, he is coming to bring it back into right relationship. Not to destroy it. Listen, even if you look and you take all of the Old Testament in context, okay? Anytime that Israel was sold into bondage, why were they sold into bondage? Because they broke the covenant. That's why Israel was sold into bondage. 
Not because God is fickle. Not because God is, is loud and if I'm doing really good, then he's happy with me. And if I'm doing really bad, then he's mad at me. No, everything that he was, does, everything that he did, everything that he is doing today is not is designed to bring people to a place of repentance. Everything that God is doing is designed to bring us to repentance. God is going to judge the nation. And that should be an exciting thing. And I maybe just made a few of you go scratch your heads and I might get some phone calls later and that's okay. But God is looking to restore a right relationship with people. So we shifted all the way back to Matthew 7 and it says, do not judge so that you will not be judged. You see, we're not to condemn, but we are to pray. You see, we're not to beat people down. We're to lift them up. We're to love them. And a way of loving them. Okay? Love says you can't live this way. Love doesn't say I'm better than you. Okay? Hear me on this. Love doesn't say, I'm better than you. That's what the Pharisees did. Love says, you know what, listen, I've been there too, and I'm going to walk through it with you. I'm not going to condemn you because you have this issue. I'm not going to look down upon you because you have this issue. Love says, I am going to help you through this thing, and I am, we're going to walk you through this thing, and we're going to allow God. To come in and judge the parts of our heart that are sinful still. We're going to allow God to come in and fight our battles for us. Because when it looks like I'm surrounded, I'm surrounded by you. When it looks like everything has gone away. When it looks like everything has gone sideways, God is looking to come in and restore right relationship. He is looking to come in and say, listen, if you will just let me stop, I will judge your enemies. I will judge your addiction. I will judge your depression. I will judge your sickness. I will judge your infirmity. I will judge this thing and you will never see it again. Listen. Western mentality, okay? So uh, Esther said this, Esther menta Western mentality. So a definition, okay? So when we talk about Western mentality, we're talking about America and Europe. When you get into an Eastern mentality way of thinking, which is how the Bible was written, it comes from um, the Jewish, the comes from the Jewish tradition, it comes from the Middle Eastern tradition, and it talks about an, an Eastern way of thinking. They they think. A little, they think differently. They have a different concepts than we do. Okay, does that? I hope, I hope Esther. I hope that answers your question. Okay, so Western mentality is where we get the concept of judge from. Comes from uh, God as judge. Actually, I believe comes from John Calvin and Calvinism when he said that you know the tulip total depravity. There's no way God's going to come in and judge us and all all of that that goes with that. There's this concept that we. That evolved and came out that said God is going to absolutely crush and destroy us all the time, right? Okay, but when we look at the Old Testament in the Eastern way of thinking, because that's the way they wrote. So when it says judge, they're not thinking black robe gavel like we do today. They're thinking God. They're thinking Ehud. They're thinking Deborah. They're thinking Samson. They're thinking um, all of the book of Judges, okay? In all of the book of Judges, the judge was there 
to deliver Israel. God raised up a judge every time. Every time that his people cried out. He said, my answer is a judge. My answer for all of our problems is a judge. And my judgments are to eradicate everything that is keeping my people away from me. Okay? God is our judge. Now, there are times, all right, listen, hear me. There are times that we are called to judge in the church. Okay? But what this scripture is really saying to us is that we must be willing to walk with and not condemn those who are alongside of us. Okay? We are walking through together. Loving one another. Preferring one another. Dealing with our own issues. Okay? And not looking down upon somebody else because they have struggles and they have issues. But we help them move through it. And like I said, here in the next couple weeks, we are going to be talking about why in those times that leadership in the church, I notice I said leadership in the church, has the ability to judge. All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this night. God, I thank you for, God, I just thank you for your word. God, and I pray that you would help us shift. God, I pray that you would help us change the way we think about who you are as judge. God, you're not, God, I just pray that you would help us to see that you are not the black robed man with a gavel waiting to send us to hell because we messed up. But God, you are the loving Abba Father who is with us and has designed to judge those areas so that we never see them again. God, I thank you for what you're doing in this place. I thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you guys. We will see you on Sunday.